to trick the audience into believing something that it can't possibly exist. Hey, you can see him from here! One totally weird solution to the monster problem, make them as inanimate as they were implacable. Monolith Monsters is this quirky little film, obviously done on a Z budget. Uh, but the monster is so bizarre. It's just these giant crystals that grow and then crash over. And they grow and crash over. And they fall on your house and then they fall on your town. Now, these films weren't A, movies directed by William Wyler and starring Montgomery Clift and Marlon Brando. Oh, no, this was a trickle-down factor. This went way below the front office down to the B-movie offices, those little wooden shingled bungalows way off in the back lot somewhere right next to probably where they made the cartoons as early as 1953 abbott and costello were satirizing giganticism but what if what if our atomic carelessness had a reverse effect that's what writer richard matheson and director jack arnold imagined in this science fiction classic Radioactive fallout is impossible to picture persuasively in a movie, but its consequences, in this case, lodge forever in a generation's memory. Nobody quite knew what radiation did. They knew it killed you. They knew it deformed you. They knew it did horrible things, and obviously, but it wasn't concrete enough because you didn't kind of see it work. Incredible Shrieking Man was a scary movie to me. I was very young at the time, and obviously, for young people to get even smaller, I mean, you already feel small as it is. So for any young person who's trying to grow up to say, no, what's going to happen? We're going to sprinkle you with magic atomic dust and you're going to get smaller and even less powerful. And as a matter of fact, there's nothing we can do to stop this. So it's like stripping away all sense of power. You're completely helpless. That was an extremely frightening idea for a young person. Forget about a kid having a problem with, with suddenly getting smaller as opposed to getting bigger. How about a man who has a wife and all of a sudden he's diminishing the psychology of that. Kiss me. You think that's gonna fix it, huh? You didn't have to stretch. You used to stand on your toes when you did that. Why, <laughs> and you're just talking feet. And I'm not even talking about the sexual side of that. I'm just talking about the idea of, of, of how your, your ego and your, and your power base in a relationship gets smaller and smaller, and eventually they, they grow apart. But I, I think I'll turn in. Come on. Yeah. Coming to bed? Yeah, soon. Well, good night, then. Good night, Louise. The guy's house becomes this nightmarish place, and it's taking the familiar and turning it, and I think that's why it's so fascinating to people. Instead of science creating these giant monsters, it created a tiny guy, and now his cat becomes his mortal enemy. I remember the danger with the cat. In science fiction, filmmakers use cats almost symbolically to portray how we feel inside about something we can't express. Cats' instincts are much better than ours, and uh, cats are more finely tuned to the dangers that surround us, while people are sometimes dumb enough to, to let the danger come right into their bedrooms and kill them while they sleep. Now, of course, when I was a kid and I saw that movie, I'm more interested in the sewing needle fight with the tarantula. It was supposed to be a house spider, but I'm sorry, that was a tarantula. That film had the advantage of character because it's basically just about him. So you're really empathizing with him and his struggle. It's sort of sad and pathetic movie. The Incredible Shrinking Man is one of the best science fiction films ever made with a very profound message about not outer space but inner space and about the soul and where does the soul go and what is infinity. Is, is infinity out there or is infinity in here? Within our fuel range, are the planets Venus and Mars. One of these should be our destination. Each of you gentlemen have before you a sheet of paper on which you will write the choice of your destination and a brief explanation of why you've chosen this particular planet. Who knew the space race began with an essay test? Colonel Bright Eyes, your ship is fuel. 
Checkoff list completed. Do you need any help? No, thank you, Major. I'm perfectly capable of getting into the rocket myself. 50s sci-fi might aim at the stars, but the dialogue often remained earthbound. The movie makers did imagine G-forces. As the imaginary astronauts left Earth behind, they were always on the alert for other dangers both science fiction and science fact had predicted. Meteor showers were a standard menace. I've been through some pretty heavy flack in my day, but that's the worst I've ever had thrown at me. Heavenly flack. <laughs> the rocket ships were sleek, but they were also roomy and rather homey. They would create love stories in space. They would head for their destinations, um, living a very terrestrial life, a very almost a soap opera type life. It's just that being confined like this has gotten on my nerves. Mine too. You listening, Carol? To what? I think that you are a prize package. Is this for Jim's benefit? And very feminine. He likes you. I sure do, Mr. Engineer. And I don't have to look in a test tube to find out. Look, we got a stowaway aboard. Weightlessness <laughs> was a known scientific problem. <laughs> hey, whoa. I need you. And a narrative issue. Hope you enjoyed the trip, Colonel. Happy landings, Bill. Thank you, Captain. They didn't have a way of doing the weightlessness, so there was always the obligatory weightless moment where somebody floats out of a chair, and then they forget about it, and then they're just walking around for the rest of, rest of the film, because they could only ever do it once. You mean this thing is waking? We're, we're, no, sir, not me. Nobody ever told me this was practical. Turn this thing around you here. Take me back. Nobody ever predicted what it would really look like. I mean, look at the LEM. Look at the real lunar module. All the spaceships that ever landed on the moon in science fiction, they were always these pointy things with these big fins at the bottom. Nobody ever predicted this gold foil covered box, you know, with insect legs. It never looked like that because our imagination was never able to predict what would really happen. We could sometimes imagine other planets as paradises with girls. On it and don't spare the atoms. We must warn the Queen. Our planet Venus has been invaded. They looked more like Hollywood starlets than space aliens. Anyway, they were eager to please. May we serve you, Earthmen? Their dancing, their music, their leotards were modern. Greenwich Village in outer space. What gives? Where are all the men around here? You are the first man I've ever seen. Well, honey, we've got to catch up for lost time. If their costumes were usually pretty spacey, their high heels owed something to Fifth Avenue. There was a hint, a hope, that space girls might be easy. Ooh, if I'd known there was going to be this kind of competition, I would have undressed for the occasion. Okay, let's get serious. The way Destination Moon did as early as 1950. It was an attempt to depict space travel as it really might occur, based on what science actually knew at the time. Destination Moon is an interesting film. I don't like the film particularly. It's an interesting film because it, only for its moment in history. It's a response to this spread that was run in Collier's magazine of these paintings done by Chesley Bonestell of these gleaming spacecraft that were going to go out and go to the moon and then go to Mars. Destination Moon was a scientific attempt to create suspense based on no bad guys, no villains, and no aliens. At the time, it was a very provocative idea because nobody had actually experienced or seen anybody go to the moon. It was a movie about the celebration of America's power and technology and intellectual capacity to be able to leave the gravitational hold that it's had on us forever and get to the moon for the first time and put men on the moon.